Greetings from Los Angeles, California. I'm Edward, and this is The Questionnaire. With me today, very, very special guest, Canadian author Gary Wayne, who penned the book, The Genesis 6 Conspiracy. Gary, Mr. Wayne, sir, very warm welcome. How are you? Very, very good, and so happy to be with you today, and so very much looking forward to the show. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, how is Canada, given the onslaught of world affairs? I'm hoping that you and your loved ones find some reprieve from the state of things. Yeah, we're doing as best as we can, and most of the family is uh, doing, you know, very, very well. But uh, you know, the COVID concerns are are out there, and my wife has a mother that's in um, a senior's home and facility, and there's uh, just been some recent. Uh, announcements of COVID in there. So they're in massive sort of containment measures. And my wife is back there it's out of province here. So, but overall things, things are, 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 are pretty good, all things considered. And uh, we're so happy that, uh, you know, that we've come through things as well as we have so far. I think that in time we'll know more. And I think the general public will know more and hopefully at some point the state of things kind of comes to uh, how would i say people will come to an understanding we'll move on from that there are so many things i want to talk to you about um i'd like to open up with prayer if that's okay with you oh absolutely absolutely okay thank you heavenly father most high we come before you with great gratitude for the breath of life and our ability to assemble and speak on the subject of your creation. We ask for blessings on our fellowship here today and for all those that listen in with us. Most High, Allah Khantav, you are glorified while we are humbled to speak on your works and ways as set forth in everything that lives. Amen and Amen. Amen. One of the things that it struck me in looking over the book when I first received the Genesis 6 conspiracy as a gift from a very close friend I consider brother and his lovely wife in Montana was the names of the subsections in the context uh, sorry the contents I have to say my eyes were really widened uh, because I wasn't that familiar with the, the work um, familiar with you for sure but I hadn't really owned the book as of yet. And I'm going to take a few seconds to read them now because the titles are just wonderful. The Antiluvian Epoch, The Golden Age, Descendants of Anak, The Terminal Generation, The Rex Deus, The House of Dragon. With subsection titles like these, it begs the reader's attention to minimal. Um, if one has great interest in the aforementioned, uh, you know, you can't help but pick it up from just what's on the cover. You know, uh, can you give us a little insight to the way you named these contact sections? Because I think people familiar with your work would be highly interested. Yeah, I was looking for a combination of, you know, using names and that you know that, that were going to be appropriate to the to the section as well as would draw people in. And one of the main goals of the book was to try and find a balance between drawing non-Christians into the journey and hopefully planting some seeds with them and also inviting Christians into it, but hopefully in a way that wasn't going to, you know, offend them in, in, in some sort of way. And that's a tough path to follow. And that's kind of one of those conundrums that publishers sort of hate because you're not specifically always targeting one group and I was trying to do both but I was more you know targeting the Christian group as opposed to the non-Christian group and I was more wanting to invite non-Christians to have a closer look as to how some of the things that they were brought up in believed in 
actually overlap to what the Bible says. They've just never been taught that that's what it's actually all about. So that's what, what I was trying to do and also draw a sense that because it's such a long narrative in terms of the time frame and the size of the size of the book is that there are significant uh, events that stretch you know a long period of time that somehow have a connection that a lot of people haven't made so that's those are kind of the things that were running through my mind as I was trying to uh, you know, name the chapters and then organize the chapters and sort of all of that sort of planning that, that went in. And I have to say that my plan changed on the book several times. So it wasn't exactly this, you know, I penned it out and I had done, you know, 100 or 98 chapters in, in, an, in an introduction and a prologue, you know, all at one time and said, okay, now I'm just going to sort of fill in the blanks. I actually, planned out 10 chapters and then as I went along I found out I needed to do more and it was sort of a, a progression so that's kind of how it came about. It's very interesting that you stated what you stated because what I found in in the first page of the preface the second paragraph is really something and um, it really drew me in it, it captured my attention right away and you know, I'd like to read it so that the listeners can get an idea of what I'm talking about. Would that be okay? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> my spiritual pursuits has been an list to my motivation to write this book. I have pursued my beliefs with all the energy contained within my spirit, even though at times I have dropped the quest with such coldness that I wondered whether or not it had ever permeated my consciousness. And yet I returned, not perceiving why or how. It is akin to a haunting voice whispering in the wilderness, drawing ever closer, yet continually evading me until confusion once more sets in. Just when I no longer can hear the calling, it once more permeates the darkness drawing me back. This 30-year journey has taught me that if I was not a Christian contrarian, the composition would have never been started, completed, completed, or published. That's really, really saying something. As you were talking about going through drafts and it, you know, kind of it not being as linear, maybe as one might perceive an author to work it, it says so much it gives me some personal insights to the auspices of the work and what you must have went through to hone it down to its completion can you share and expand on this with us well, what you wrote in the preface yeah and I wanted to communicate with the audience that for me this was not just a simple project and the difficulties in completing the project were for me significant particularly mentally and, and spiritually and so when I moved away from doing more or less a biblical document or biblical research only and that's when it, it expanded from sort of those 10 chapters that led me down a lot of rabbit holes and I started to mix in parallel accounts that come on, come in from other religions and other cultures and mythoses and legends. And that led me into the secret societies and a whole bunch of more rabbit holes that once you go down so many of these rabbit holes, you just kind of wonder like, have I, have I just sort of lost my mind here? Have I gone so far astray that nobody is going to believe this nobody is going to think that you know any of this makes any sense how am I going to continue to look at this other information understand it not have it corrupt me and yet bring it back and measure against what the Bible says because everything I'm trying to do in the book is 
and I, and I clearly write that you know the book is written from a Christian um, bias, but again, I, I'm trying to do that you know invite non Christians in. So how am I going to make sense of this? How am I going to measure it against what the Bible says? and not come off sounding like some sort of crazy person or lunatic and so those were the struggles and so you get to certain points where you say you know what i just can't do this anymore this just doesn't make any sense this it just this is craziness it's it's too big and so you just kind of walk away and you know i think god works in ways where you know, he doesn't give you anything that you can't handle, and he's very, very patient, and yet he draws you back in, and he, he seemed to be drawing me back in all of the time. And then as I was getting towards the end of it, I was wanting to end it because it was so many years, so much work, so much investigation, so much time that I just wanted to complete it. But every time I thought I would be finished, I would be drawn somewhere to find some more information or more information would be sent to me in inexplicably you know, obtained information and I would say no I don't I don't want to deal with any more information but then I would be saying okay I have to have a look at this and then I find the information is very relevant and then I have to find a way to weave it in through the rest of the book and that happened so many different times and so even at the end and when i got to the end and i thought you know okay now i got to weed it down because it's you know closer to 1200 pages than the 800 pages that you know we put out for publication is what do i weed down and do i really want to do this i mean you're out there with all of this information it's all sourced and i have over 100 pages of uh, footnotes in it so people can verify where i get my information and i let the spurious forces speak for themselves so that i'm not manipulating what they're saying but it's just was like do i really want to expose myself to this and yet i was always sort of brought back and convinced yeah this is what this is what i'm supposed to do and put out the information and we'll see when you know so my attitude was is at the end is, is let's put out the information and see what happens and then you go through that whole struggle of trying to get published with such a crazy idea and these two conflicting things about me is one I didn't have a platform and two it was a huge book so it was an expensive project so high risk and uh, and uh, no no experience and no platform or anything for anybody to to sell with it so but i found a way to get it published and from there then it was okay now how do i get that message out other than okay you've got a printed book and then that's a whole new experience that you go through but that's kind of all the different kinds of things just and i know it was kind of a long answer but it was a, such a very good question uh, that i wanted people to know that this wasn't just something that you know was done and penned easily it all the way through it was a struggle struggle within myself struggle with what am i really trying to do here it would be just easier to do it this way and yet i was able to through through god's help i think find my way through and do it at a, at a pace that uh, hopefully i produce something that makes sense for people that was excellent um, I can't begin to tell you how many points you covered. I don't relate to it as an author because I don't write. My other end of it is the audiovisual uh, side of media. But I do have a friend who would completely be able to take in what you said and almost use it as a as verbiage of encouragement. Being led uh, by God in the pursuit of something. And I would consider what you're doing uh, his work. It's something that people, whether they are communicating with other people, sharing their stories, uh, writing a dissertation, if it is something that is related to his story, it seems like people can echo the very thing that you just said. It may be just in different, in different ways. Um, my heart really goes out to you and by reading just reading the preface if you pay attention to it and you have enough personal experience it's very clear that what you just described 
is exactly what happens when you do a work like this. Um, I really commend you for the amount of time it must have taken and the, the mental drain it must have had on you and, and your spirit to produce something like this. I hope that you and other people reap the rewards for relaying what you know. I mean, it's really hard for me to imagine because of my background, it's hard to imagine what you must have went through. And as a matter of fact, many others that I know, when they go, you know, I hate to use the term down the rabbit hole, but, you know, in a sense, when they're seeking, they find out how things really are, or if they're surface level and their scriptural studies, and they go back to peek in, and perhaps maybe the Holy Spirit as it's called, or the breath of Father comes in and touches them to re-read things and go over things with a different understanding. Stuff became, you know, begins to peek out at you, and it's like a revelation. One of the questions I have for you, which is the gap that's kind of important to me. Um, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And I'm going to read it right now. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2. And the earth was tohu vavohu, without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Ruach Elohim was hovering upon the face of the waters. This was taken from the Orthodox Jewish Bible. It just happened to be what I pulled. I have different translations, different Targums, and, and they say pretty much the same thing. Um, the gap, the age that was before the fall. Please share with me your perspective. And are there numerous manuscripts or sources that reinforce what it states in Genesis at that address. Well, what's interesting about Genesis 1, and I noticed it as I was reaching out kind of further from my initial start as I came back to Christ, and I, I came back to Christ on a, on, on a specific Bible that's written in modern language, and I know it takes a lot of um, has a lot of wraps out there for not being a good translation in a lot of people's minds, but that's the NIV Bible in the 1973 edition, which I still have and I have recovered because it has a special place in my heart. And what's interesting in there, and as I looked and started reading into other Bibles, I noticed that there's every Bible has sort of some unique annotations and in word translations. In, in Genesis, in the NIV, it had this annotation at the bottom of the page that said, you know, where the King James Version Bible says, and the earth was uh, without form and, and void. The annotation in the NIV said, it can alternately translate it as became. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Um, and But at the beginning, I'm not really all that concerned about that. But as I dug deeper into it, and I, I certainly don't show some of the levels of the research that I did in the book as I get into some of these subjects, and I do touch on the gap theory in, in, in the Bible, and kind of look at it as a better position for where the rebellion of the angels would have taken place. And just in terms of the timing, in terms of the other facts that, 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 we're, that we have that's at our hands out in, in, in the world today. So I thought that's rather interesting. Why is it could be became? And so as I, as I dug deeper into the Hebrew aspect of it, you find out it could be translated was or became. So which one is it? because it has a significant difference in terms of how you understand Genesis 1. What's interesting, there's a parallel passage in the Psalms in 104, where it has uh, God 
sending when he sends his spirit to earth is renewed and that's 104 30 and it has actually kind of a an interesting creation account not in exactly the same order but it's got the same type of details and actually includes when the angels were created in the beginning and when the foundations of the earth that were created and you find out that the foundations are as you link up Psalms and Job's and all of the chapters that has foundations, is that these foundations were created forever so that it could not be destroyed. And yet you have, in, the, in these two accounts, you have angels that were created before the heavens and the earth are created. And then you have this alternate translation. And then you have this renewal aspect in 104.30. And then you also have that same spirit hovering over in Genesis 2. So as a contrarian, these things start to make me ask questions and more questions and dig deeper. And then as you get into some of it, and I won't go into all of the detail, and I have, you know, uh, significant, uh, I have two really good documents on this if people want to get into it. And it also takes into Exodus 20 as well on the six days of creation as to what that heaven means. But what you have is that this earth is, is destroyed in the gap theory between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. So it becomes void and it becomes formless. And that's when you get into the Hebrew words tuhu and boohoo and you find out that, you know, they're, they're meaning words like ruin and things like that. And so I'm, I'm not doctrinal as to whether or not the earth was, is, is only essentially 6,000 and maybe a few thousand more years old as the standard doctrine and translation comes out, or that it is much older and that the earth was renewed in the six days and that the angelic rebellion is what would have caused the earth to be destroyed and by fire as what Peter talks about in 2 Peter 3, where you had this earth that was destroyed in the beginning by fire and the earth that was in water and was out of water. And what it's talking about is when you destroy the earth is that the waters collapse inwards. And the earth is destroyed right down to the foundations in the, in, in the gap understanding. And that when the earth is renewed, then God has to separate those waters so that life can begin on the earth. And then you establish the firmament, which is the first heaven and the second heaven, which is just outside. And then, of course, there's the heavenly realm. So when I look at how that is brings into a whole sort of open door of other things that start to make more sense, it has a plausible place in my mind that we need to be open to the fact that the standard dogma may not be what actually happened and that the earth is much older and that when you look at things like the dinosaurs which are now told to be feathered beings and that we know that the seraphim fiery serpent angels which were flying dragons and as they would have been known in antiquity it makes sense that those dominating beings in this case, in the gap period before its first destruction, might have been the favored animals of these rebellious fallen angels after they after they rebelled. So, and again, I think it's one of those things that we need to be very open to and not dogmatic on because uh, there's a very good case for both sides of the story. It leads into some other things that I want to ask. I was, sorry to interrupt, I was just about to add, you know, not only do I have those documents, but I did a two and a half hour presentation if people are really interested in it. And it was done at the True Legends virtual conference in May uh, this year. And uh, you have to pay for it and get it on the DVD. But I walk through every aspect of this and show how that case could be made. So if people are interested in that, they can get a hold of the documents for me, or you can go get that DVD from the True Legends people. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you. That has to be unbelievably interesting. Uh, with the gap in time, do you have thoughts on placement of pre-Homo sapiens and Neanderthals with or without respect to secular timelines? And it sounds like you would, based on what you just said. For me, it can fit in two different places again. It can fit in the gap period, particularly when you get these humanoids that go back into 
you know, tens of thousands of years and hundreds of thousands of years. But you also have this positioning where we don't know whether or not a day is just one day, or again, as you know, Second Peter three talks about, a day is a thousand years. So that if you have each day, that's six thousand years in the days of creation. Um, and then you have the seventh day, which is another day, and then you have what happens afterwards, which could a lot of people look at as, as the eighth day. And is that uh, enough of a period to include some of these human-like beings that but are a little bit different? And if you factor in the fact then that you know all of these different beings were created on you know between days four and six with humans being created in day six were there some of these other beings around you know a few thousand years before again i think most of that would fit better in with with the uh destruction of the earth and then the renewal of the earth beginning in genesis 1 2. so very fascinating to be able to speak to you on these topics and um bounce some of the questions I have off of you. Uh, your answers are loaded. There are so many points. I mean, it's a three-hour, you know, symposium just on one of your answers. I want to jump uh, into the seven sacred sciences. As I understand it, Enoch has outlined in Enoch 1, the fallen watchers gave these to their offspring, or so you could come to that conclusion, and the men of earth. Was Adam given the sciences and left with them at the expulsion of the garden? If so, can you expand and delineate between the application of knowledge sets and the application of wisdom between Seth's lineage and Cain's lineage? Yeah, very, very good question. And what we do know is that knowledge can be used for good or for evil. There's always two sides to the coin. The knowledge isn't what's evil, it's how it's applied. And that's what's so important about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in, in the garden is that before understanding good and evil, any knowledge that Adam would have used would have been used innocently for good and to honor the God of all things. And so Adam, when he's created, he is placed into this garden and it has many things running in it. It has significant size rivers that are flowing through. It has all sorts of trees that are growing in it. And you, he's looking after crops and things as you understand the language that's in Genesis 2, particularly as you take that back to, the, to, to Hebrew, that he needs knowledge as a sophisticated agrarian and he's all by himself at this point in time. So he needs additional knowledge to be that first agrarian and to look after the garden. And of course, later he's, he's provided with Eve from the rib. And then there's just two of them. So we understand just from this basic story from a Christian perspective that he receives knowledge. And then by the time he eats of the apple after Eve gives him the apple to eat or fruit, I guess I shouldn't say apple, it's just sort of how people sort of look at it that, that it is, but he, he eats of the fruit and now he gets additional knowledge of evil. And then he gets expelled from the Eden Garden along with Eve, and then Cain and Abel, and then Seth are born. And so we learn very, very quickly again that this agrarian knowledge is being put into place with Cain and Abel, one raising uh, animals and one growing crops. And then Cain rebels and kills his brother. And Seth is born sometime later. Now Cain moves away to a place called Nod and he starts to apply these sciences and he takes a wife and Enoch is born, Enoch son of Cain as opposed to Enoch son of Jared, and teaches this knowledge according to 
what the Gnostics and the secret societies say, this knowledge now starts to break down, but it starts to answer where did he get the knowledge to build a city and build a civilization? Because he learned some knowledge as the Gnostics and secret societies say from Adam that was taught to him in Eden. And then his son Enoch divides this knowledge and starts using it towards the evil side into seven sacred sciences as a better way of dividing it up and developing those disciplines. And then that knowledge is then embedded into a religion, a polytheist religion that I call Enochian mysticism, that houses this secret knowledge and develops it, which then leads to the development of the mystery schools for specific aspects within those disciplines. And this is the knowledge then that is going to, according to their uh, history and, and information passed on, is they're going to receive additional knowledge from the fallen angels, which is going to accelerate this knowledge and lead the antediluvian world uh, into destruction. So again, if we look at knowledge, it's how it's being used. And obviously that evil side is being used from the Cain descendants versus the Sethians that were told from Josephus and other accounts. And that according to the Bible that after Enos is born, the Sethites begin to honor the name of God again. So we take it that that lineage is going to be handling the knowledge in the way it was originally designed to be given for Adam and in an agrarian manner and not into this expanded version that is going to lead to war and all sorts of other things that weren't around when Adam and Eve first started, but only happens with the rebellion of Cain and what he does, what does with this knowledge. So we get an understanding in the Bible that right through Noah that this knowledge is used in a righteous manner from Seth and Enosh going forward, or Enosh going forward, and from the Cainite side with Enoch, son of Cain, right down through to Lamech and Tubal Cain and Nama and Jubel and Jubal, as using this to develop these sciences, but not in a way that's designed to honor the God. And in fact, that becomes one of the four significant pillars of polytheism. One is that all that knowledge is developed to deny the existence of God, or at least his stature. And that's the second pillar is one is to deny, the second is to degrade God and not give God credit for anything. And the other fourth one is, is to honor their pantheon of gods through these sciences and to build monuments to honor them as well. And that is exactly what happens with the seven sacred sciences as you move forward into contemporary times. All of it is designed to leave God out of the equation, so deny God. All of it is designed to come up with some sort of answers that do not go back to God. Anything but God or creation uh, is theories is acceptable, but you can't even look at anything else. And you're, they're, it's designed to lead people away from God, right? Which is, again, part of those four pillars. And then to honor their own pantheon of gods. And then, of course, in secular education, you have all of these polytheist monuments and degrees and everything that is absolutely tied back to in the initial Enochian mysticism and how secret societies are set up with their degree structure, as were the mystery religions, which initially had three degrees. And in, in the contemporary times, we now get the Scottish Rite Gnostics and Freemasons that divide those three degrees 11 times. And to 33, 33 degrees, but essentially the same sort of format. And that's why you get these degrees in university, because it's all modeled on the seven sacred sciences. I have heard that there are not only 33 degrees in the lodges. I've heard that there are actually 360, but I don't know if that's true or not. Do you have any insight to that? So again, if you go back to the modern uh, go back to the more ancient and the York Rite in the in the Masonic uh, version in the mystical schools. You have three. So what we do know is there's more than three degrees. I don't know how many there are, but I know that if you're going to be a regional manager within Freemasonry, you have to be fifth degree to oversee multiple lodges. If you're going to be Rosicrucian, you're going to have to be at least seven, as I understand it. 
Some have told me there are as many as uh, nine or 12 or 13, but I don't have anything that I can define on that. The only thing I would say then is that any of those numbers except for 12 wouldn't really go into 360 degrees, um, but you could redefine the divisions within those degrees through, and they would use uh, prime numbers um, to add up to that number. So that's how it would get to that. But again, I don't have evidence to suggest that there is 360 degrees, but it would be consistent with their philosophy and theology. With what you said, can we make connections from the, you know, speaking of the city of Cain, and we were, we were speaking about structures earlier. Can we make connections from the ancient megalithic structures between the Far East and particularly modern day Iraq, Egypt, Mexico, and Peru? Well, I, I think we can. I think if you look at all the cultures around the world, they have, and we're talking in prehistory, and then as we come out of the post Diluvian epoch, you get inexplicable, unaccountable, unexplained crossovers and consistencies that suggest sort of connections. One of them would be the architecture that they're building. And in the polytheist mystical belief system is you're going to build these monuments to honor your gods and you're going to use sacred ge geometry and number mysticism all the way throughout. So it's going to be absolutely part of the polytheist mystical belief system. And one of the architectural consistencies that happen around the world are pyramid-like structures that have those same sort of traits put in, whether or not it's sacred geometry, certain angles, um, relationships to the size of the earth, constellations, all those sorts of things that would go in it. And the pyramid is unaccountably on all continents around the world. And we can't necessarily say, I, I, I'll back up a little bit, that Antarctica has those pyramids, but we can't rule that out. We don't know what may, might be under, under the ice. But it's one of those heritages that seems to be consistent. And that makes sense if you understand that both before the flood and then again after the flood, you have the same root religion. And so this is that Enochian mysticism that is going to spread throughout however many civilizations there might have been around the world. This happens again after the flood and according to again secret societies and Gnostics is that Hermes finds this knowledge that Enoch had written down into 36,525 books. Again, I think that's probably an allegorical number to represent the solar uh, type of uh, universal understanding or cosmology that they have that also relates to solar worship. And again, the Onokian mysticism was sun worshiping and a bull cult. And this is the same religion that's going to cross the flood because this knowledge is found in these books that are, according to their legends and history, stored in nine vault stack one on top of each other underneath the pyramids and they accredit Hermes which is again a very famous patriarch in polytheism and Hermes Trismegistus as, as some people might understand it three out uh, of three times Hermes or possibly and likely three individuals that becomes Hermes that they would equate going back as one of those as Enoch um, of uh, the son of Cain who developed this knowledge. So this knowledge is hidden under the pyramids. Hermes finds it and takes it to, to Nimrod and they create Babel City and Babel Tower from this knowledge and re-implement Enochian mysticism. And then comes the dispersion of Babel and you have Shinar, which is transliteration for Sumer, that Nimrod is going to stay in and develop through his polytheist priests who become the wise men and the magi as we know them in the Bible. And the second pillar goes over to Egypt with Hermes and Mizraim and Ham. And Egypt and Mesopotamia are the two sort of epicenters that polytheism is going to spread around the earth. So the Egyptian religion sort of spreads around the 
Mediterranean and into Africa and the Mesopotamian religion of Nimrod that he's continuing to develop after Babel spreads into India, China, Southeast Asia. So they will start to rebuild many of these monuments. And that is, to me, is, is how you start to link up the similarities. Just as you have all of this imagery throughout the world with serpent gods and serpent kings, which is inexplicable and inexplainable again, both before the flood and after the flood. And the only way that you can explain it is, is they were worshiping the same pantheon of gods that, that provided the same kind of additional knowledge to build these structures because there's no way they would have been able to develop the knowledge to the level that they did on their own to build those type of structures that we can't even do today. You know, I had another question and it is completely in line with what you're speaking on and the previous question. It really has to do with whether or not you have any insight to who built the Mexico's and Peru's megalithic structures. And as you were mentioning timelines, does this all add up to what I deem as the old world order of Nimrod? Or is it a bit older than uh, what we think? Have you come across any information that would lead you to suspect that Mexico and Peru or other structures found worldwide predate Egypt's oldest? The only knowledge that we have, because a lot of the records are lost in those societies, and they weren't necessarily, you know, writing things down in extensive libraries that were, you know, going on um, in, in around the Middle East. So it there's limited knowledge on that, but all the information that we get suggests that these great cities and these great megaliths that are done to a level of knowledge that we can't do today, they inherit it. They didn't build themselves. They may have refurbished them, restored them, but they didn't build them. And that they inherited them from an age before. And so when you start to see other buildings and other uh, cities, you start to see almost a, deg a degradation of that knowledge or that science. So there's a time where the humans start to try and build their own, but they're not at the same level as with this divine knowledge that was provided by the fallen angels to either build these cities. And then there's another tradition where, you know, in polytheism is that the gods built these cities you know, all by themselves, and then when humans were created, they, they inherited them. I think it's more just antediluvian cities that survived, just as, you know, you get pyramids being shown on the stella uh, of many. You've got this great pyramid that's shown in, on that pillar, and that predates the 2300 time frame of Kephra and or other pharaohs around that time who are credited with, with restoring it. This goes back to about 3000 BC on the secular timetable. So they're much older than secular science wants to, wants to recognize. So I think there is things that are pointing in that direction. Just as you get these underwater cities all around the world that they have no idea how old they are or where they came from but through these fantastic cities. And then you get like Machu Picchu that's built up in the mountains as to how they think humans could have done that, you know, after the flood with the knowledge, which was, you know, scant compared to the level of that knowledge being developed before the flood is, is just mind boggling. But we get lots of examples. You just have to sort of take a look around and then start asking questions. Are we being provided propaganda? Or are, is there a different, should we be looking for a different answer for who built these and why and when? I want to go back just a little bit, uh, touch on one other point that I had, and it is linked to the sciences, at least in my opinion. And uh, right now I'm just going to read the book of Jasher or Yashar. Chapter 53, 18 through 22. And he ordered them to bring before him the map of the stars, whereby 
Yosef knew all the times, and Joseph said unto Benjamin, I have heard that the Hebrews are acquainted with all wisdom. Dost thou know anything of this? Verse 19. And Benjamin said, Thy servant is knowing also in all the wisdom which my father taught me. And Joseph said unto Benjamin, Look now at this instrument, and understand where thy brother Joseph is in Egypt, who you said went down to Egypt. Verse 20. And Benjamin beheld the instrument with the map of the stars of heaven, and he was wise, and looked therein to know where his brother was. Was Benjamin reading Joseph's natal chart? And another instrument, maybe perhaps like a sextant? It's, it's a good question. And as we don't know about the Book of Yasher, is is that the original book and it, is it unchanged? And some there's a, some problematic chapters, but the big thing is we don't really have the, well, we don't have the original Hebrew. So we're not sure. We know there was a Book of Yasher, but we're not sure about all of the information. Having said that, when we're looking at what God does for Abraham and for Joseph and for Isaac and the knowledge and the help that he is providing, I mean, one would expect that for the nation of hope, the nation that's created as a nation of priests set aside for the world with a special commission to bring on the Messiah who would become our Redeemer, then one would expect that God is going to reveal things to these individuals and that they're going to honor that information in the way that it ought to be honored and are very, very careful as to what knowledge should be used and how and who should know that knowledge. Not that I'm saying they practiced mysticism in, in any sort of way. I think they just handled it in a way that was meant to uh, honor God and in the, in the instructions that they would have been provided. So I think some of the great patriarchs were provided incredible information, whether or not they fully understood that or not. So Again, I can't verify the knowledge that that is being talked about in the book of book of Yasher, and there's some certainly some, what I would say, mystical Kabbalistic things that are in the current book of book of Yasher. But I would certainly say that there is this additional knowledge, and it needs to be used when it comes from God for only the use of good as opposed to to evil and therefore the people that he would select to provide that knowledge would be disciplined in 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 a manner to be able to deal with that information so again you would be uh, getting a scenario where that's talked about in the book of yasher there where where it the, the knowledge is being confirmed but you don't really learn a whole bunch more about it This definitely, for me, is the dichotomy between uh, the knowledge and the wisdom held by either Seth or Cain and the application of it, as you've talked about pretty extensively in this. What you're echoing over and over again is my feeling on it. It's really the application of the knowledge and wisdom and how you use it. And does it glorify the Father or, or does it not? Do you have other works in terms of literary works, books, any touring, anything you want to share with us? I'm, I'm really interested in other possible publications that are going to come out soon. Sure. The first thing is, is traditionally I do two or three conferences a year. Uh, this year, both of them that I had committed to um, were canceled and I had to do one virtually. And so there's nothing on the books for this year, although I'm working uh, talking to a lot of people doing some virtual ones, but they have some issues in terms of, uh, you know, sort of making a return on the investment of the people that are, are doing it. So they aren't quite what were, you know, was to be anticipated. So nothing booked for a speaking tour this year, but hopefully after travel opens up, that, that will happen. I am working on another book. It's not one that's 
directly related to what I wrote in the first book, although my publisher wants me to do uh, uh, a sequel and I have more than enough material to write a sequel. But the book I'm currently working on is, and I've, I've started over and, and, and come back to it. And I was trying to write this book kind of in kind of the manner that I did Gen 6 with, but this one needs to be specifically targeted for to uh, Christians, I think. And so I've been led to, and, and, and when I say I'm led, I'm, I'm not saying I have direct conversations with God and I'm not saying I'm a prophet, but I, I do listen to uh, in my prayers in my thoughts to what I think God wants me to do. And it seems to me I need to make this strictly for Christians to help Christians in the understanding. And it starts in the time of giants after the flood. And it starts with Abraham who lived amongst the Raphaim nations in the, in the, in the promised land that Abraham has promised. And it's about that holy covenant. And it's about the curses and the blessings of the covenant and how prophecy and everything is going to be fulfilled unfortunately through the curses of the covenant and that all of this plays out through the time of the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom both being disturbed uh, dispersed but with the northern kingdom israel uh, being lost into the world and so i'm going to cover that off then i'm going to cover off limited parts maybe as to uh, where they might be in the world today, but more focused in the direction of is what is the importance of Judah and Israel in the end time? So it's leading, the first part sort of leads into setting up for the prophecies for Judah and for Israel in the end time and to how to understand and apply those prophecies as they're laid out in the Bible, which is very, very simple. You know, if it says Israel, apply it to Israel. If it says Judah, apply it to Judah. And don't confuse the two and don't confuse the church in those prophecies. And that there is a time when lost Israel that is going to be awakened and called back to God. And a time when both will recognize Jesus as their Redeemer and there will be a second Exodus and how that all fits into the end time. So that's the project that I'm currently working on. And uh, I am uh, I was struggling with it, but I'm now sort of laser focused on it. I just need to find a little bit more time to spend in, in getting it done. So I get it done in a shorter manner than a, than a longer time frame. But that's that's book I'm currently working on and then I'll come back and do a whole bunch of things on the Genesis 6 because that's what the publisher uh, would like me to do for for the for the third book so he'd actually like me to do that first but my heart's in this one so that's what I'm going to do first that sounds excellent um, personally I can't wait I want to close now and I want to thank you very much for being on this show and sharing with everyone who's going to listen and myself you're such a wealth of knowledge, Gary, and I would really love and hope that you would come back again. Uh, maybe we can have a guest on and have you speak with him at a later date when your schedule is more open. Would you like to close in a, in a brief prayer? Sure. I'd also like to say I would come back anytime. And, you know, for people who have read the book or, you know, um, have questions on certain topics, I have so many documents that I provide for free so that if people wanted you know I mentioned the Rephaim in the time of Abraham so if you wanted information on that or all of the giant wars in the time of the Exodus or you know I have a lot of documents you just have to get a hold of me through my website which is the Genesis 6 conspiracy.com with the number 6 conspiracy.com give me the topic name if I got a document on that I will send it to you so uh, thank you for having me, and we'll now I'll now close out, out in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for permitting and allowing us to communicate and commune in the way that we have today. And I ask that you bless everybody who has been listening to our conversations today, and to bless them that if they find something of value that they would continue to look in that direction, but all in the honor of your name and who you are and for the good of your cause. And that we thank you 
for allowing us to talk freely and to try and expand and nourish not only the people who are already believers, but hopefully that knowledge will start to be passed on to people who are non-believers so that they might be saved as well. So we also pray that you help us do things on earth as they are done in heaven, and we pray all of these things in the name of our Redeemer, the Word Jesus, who sits at your right-hand side and testifies to you for us and for all of the saints. And we also pray in the name of the Holy Spirit, in your great and holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gary, so much. I deeply, deeply appreciate it. Well, you're quite welcome.